Good morning. Baruch Abba, B'Shem Adonai. Why, uh, where is that phrase from? Why is it being used? What's the context? Baruch Abba, B'Shem Adonai. Yes, your context, the context. Jesus said that uh, you'll not see my face again until all Israel says, Baruch Abba, B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But not us, right? Mm -mm. We say, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu. What does that mean? Blessed be the Lord, our God. We know now, right? Yeah. The New Testament was written in what language? Greek, Koine Greek. But it needs to be understood with what mind? Jewish. A Jewish mindset, and then it explodes with meaning, right? And so if you're new here this morning, we're not a Messianic congregation, but during this time of year, during the Passover season, we sing a lot of Hebraic praise and worship. Just as in the Christmas season, we sing a lot of Christmas music, okay? Because it's relative to the time in which we're in. And as Gentiles, we want to understand as much as we can about the Jewish Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. Amen? Mm. So that's why we do that. I place a great emphasis upon the Israelogy of the Bible, the Jewishness of the Bible, that you understand that Christianity is not separate from ancient Judaism or modern, uh, ancient Hebraism or modern Judaism. We are the completion of. You understand that? We've been grafted in. They haven't been grafted in. We've been grafted in, right, into Israel. But unfortunately, in our day and time, uh, there's very little who understand that. And the anti-Semitism is far too prevalent, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Happy Palm Sunday. Mm. Last time we were together, we were in John's Gospel, and we ended chapter 16. And Jesus said, I have spoken these things to you that in me... I have spoken these things to you that in me you may have peace. peace. 1633. Was he talking about world peace? National peace? What kind of peace was he talking about? Personal. Personal peace. Spiritual peace. Peace with the Lord. Peace with God. Peace of God. Peace in God. And we talked about that at great length last week. But this week, as we look at the uh, triumphal entry, the record of that Palm Sunday, we're going to see that there was a tremendous misunderstanding in what Jesus was bringing to Israel. He was not bringing a national peace. Peace. He was not bringing a freedom from the oppression of the Romans and making Israel a predominant nation among the nations once again. No, no, no. What he offered them was far more important. It's the same thing he's offering to the world today, a personal peace. There, there can be a cessation of all hostilities. You know, there's been periods of peace in the United States, hasn't there? I think in my lifetime. When, when did the Korean War end? <laughs> 1955. When did the Vietnam War begin? 1964 is when we entered. But during that period, it was relatively a period of peace for the United States. There was some prosperity. We were very productive. We were on the rise. But if you didn't know K-N-O-W Jesus, then you didn't know K-N-O-W peace, right? Because N-O Jesus, N-O peace. And so you can have a cessation of hostilities. You can have peace and prosperity. You can have safe board. You can have all the things that a nation should afford his citizenry. But if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, your life's in turmoil. You have no peace. You walk up on the stage and for no perceived reason slap somebody in the face. <laughs> and we see so many people today, unfortunately, Unfortunately, in our day and time, who do not have that peace. More irreligious people per capita in the United States than ever before. Than ever before. What we deprive ourselves of, not us, because you know him. Barukata, I don't know, I don't know. The Lord my God, right? But those who don't know him don't know that peace. And that's what we want to look at this morning. Now, as we were in John's gospel, Jesus ended his public ministry to Israel when? That's right, chapter 12. You pay such good attention. But before chapter 12, preceding chapter 12 was chapter 
I'm telling you, you're just <laughs> scholars extraordinaire. Right? Chapter 11. Now, what happened in chapter 11 that was so significant? Can you drop that mat down for a minute? Lazarus, come forth. Right? Yeah. We, we should all put on our stone, you know. Lazarus, I was dead, but now I'm alive, right? Because we're all Lazarus, aren't we? Yeah. But go to chapter 11 for a minute of John's gospel. We're going to go to a few places this morning. I hope you bear with me. I only have a three-hour message. <laughs> you know, it's hard to decide what you want to share when you've taught 31 Palm Sundays. But in chapter 11, but you know, it all bears repeating itself, doesn't it? We'll be singing the praises and the glory of God for generations to come. But as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And what I want you to understand, that Jesus' following was huge even before this event, which was paramount. Um, look at Luke 12 for a moment. While you're, keep your finger there in John. Look at Luke 12. I think I want to go there. Is it Luke 12? Let's see. Luke 12, verse 1. Everybody there? Jesus was doing an exhaustive teaching as well to the people of Israel. A few were getting it. But it, it, as because of the miracles that he was performing, and they did have an un ex unrealistic expectation that he was going to bring in the kingdom of Israel then, right then and there. In the meantime, verse 1, chapter 12, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Aren't we glad that hypocrisy has erased itself today in the church? <laughs> oh, boy, the number one argument why unbelievers don't want to become believers because the church is full of? <laughs> it's true. There are more make-believers in the church than there are believers. There are more Christians in name only, beloved, not in devotion to the Lord. Oh, please, by all means, grab a copy of John Michael's write-up on Decimus. Dicemus, the thief that's on the cross that believed, you know. Gaius was the other who didn't believe, but Dicemus was the one who believed. What does Dicemus mean? Sunrise. And the sun rose over him that day, didn't it? But you want to read that paper in its entirety, and it's a wonderful paper full of uh, some glorious facts, full of some sad facts. Like 12% of the people asked the question, who is Joan of Arc? And you know what they said? <laughs> Noah's wife. A number of high school students when asked where Sodom and Gomorrah was, they said they were husband and wife. 60% of the church cannot name the Ten Commandments. Anybody want to take a shot, stab at it? Hmm? That's... Oh, we know them all, don't we? Yes, we do, dear. Yeah, just... But it's not so much knowing them as it is... Obeying them, obeying them, that's right, that's right. But here, here's this huge innumerable crowd there. And Jesus did a teaching in chapter 3. You know, he did, he did a couple of parables on fig trees. You know, the one that's most popular is that learn the lesson from the fig tree that you know when its leaves have turned green, you know summer is near. Know this too, that the generation that sees this will see Jesus is coming, right? Now, we all know that one. But many don't know the parable of the fig tree here in chapter 13 of Luke's gospel. Look at that for a moment. Believe me, I'm going to get back to John. Isn't that where it was, John? Yeah. Chapter 13 of Luke, verse 6. Jesus spoke a parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit upon it and found none. And he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come. How long was his ministry on earth? Three years, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? You know, we, they think we're crazy with all of these uh, decorative trees that we have, hybrids, Bradford pear. What's a Bradford pear? Hmm? 
It's an abomination. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a fake pear tree, like a lot of these fake Christians, right? It looks like a pear tree. It gives off a blossom in the spring like a pear tree. But when it comes for the season of fruit, and also it... Yeah, that's like a lot of false Christians. You know, no fruit, but they stink. Their life stinks. <laughs> he found none. Verse 7, then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it take up the ground? And he answered and he said, sir, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, and if not, after that, you can cut it down. You know, that was a cut. My, my grandfather, Alfonso, he had a fig tree in the backyard. And you know what he would do with that fig tree every fall? Bury it. You'd have to un uncover one side of the root system. And he built a trench. He buried the tree covered with leaves. Why? To protect it during the winter. And then he raised it up and it produced wonderful fruit. But here, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about whenever the fig tree is mentioned in a figurative sense, it's always, always speaking of Israel. Israel. And we know from the gospel accounts as well that Jesus was passing by a fig tree literally one day seeking fruit from it. It was a season of figs and there were none. And what did he do? Cursed. He cursed it. It withered and died. And the next day, the very next day, the disciples went by and the tree was dead from the roots up. You could have kicked it over with your foot. Speaking of what would happen to Israel. Why? Why? Because their Messiah did come. But they were seeking peace and prosperity in this life. They were the name it and claim it crowd, right? Health and wealth gospel. They didn't want what Jesus was offering in the spiritual realm. They didn't want a personal peace that nothing could ever steal from you. No circumstance, no situation. No. And unfortunately, he judged them for it, didn't he? Do you think there's a parallel to today, beloved? If you don't see it, you're blind. But if you need help, I'll help you connect the dots later. You know, very, very important, very imperative at this time, at this season, that you are truly seeking the Lord, submitting yourself, surrendering yourself, yielding yourself, so that he could produce the fruit that he desires out of your life, not your own personal peace and prosperity. And I, I say these things not to harm you. I say these things not to convict you. I say these things to touch your heart. And for you to allow the Holy Spirit to change your life and your priorities. I, I don't want anybody left here the Sunday after the rapture. Not a one. You know. Well, later on, you know, in uh, chapter 17 of Luke's Gospel... And again, I'm thinking, you know, he, his, his disciples and the crowd all believed he was going to bring in the kingdom now. When will you bring in the kingdom, Jesus? Now? If only we had Trump back. <laughs> listen, listen to me and listen. Yeah, vote, vote correctly. Vote intelligently. Vote your conscience. Vote those things that are important to God. Yes, yes. But... I've been a minister for over, 40 year, uh, over 30 years. I've been a believer for over 40 years. And, and I don't see any spiritual fruit. Yes, he's a conservative man fiscally. Yes, he's a conservative man in many ways. But, but spiritual, saved, born again, I, I don't see that. I'm sorry, I just don't see it. I don't see the fruit, the evidence thereof. But here's what I want to tell you. There is no political solution to what ails us. Do you understand that? Vote intelligently. Vote the issues that are most important to the heart of God. But where we should put our trust completely is in the Lord. There is no Savior save Jesus. And before he comes, he must judge. Just as in Israel. But here the question was asked. Uh, pick it up in uh, 1720. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come... He answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. He came to give that personal peace, that relationship with God. When you become born again, a citizen of heaven. 
Verse 22, then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, you will not see them. What is he saying? He's leaving. I have said these things that in me you may have, but in this world you will have. And there was a time of tribulation coming for Israel that, that never happened before. No, and, and, and there's another time coming that will never happen before, never happen again. But there was a time of tribulation coming for Israel that no one had ever expected what would take place. Three years, just give it three, three years I've given it, three years of my ministry, and there's still no fruit. One more year, just give it one more year. Did he give it one more year? No, he gave it almost 40 years. When was the destruction of Jerusalem? 70 AD. Did they turn? Was there repentance? No, no, no. And so he had to judge. And that's why he's saying, you'll, you'll wish and you'll pray that to be one way, one more day with the Son of Man, but you won't have it because I'm leaving. I'm going away. But he's coming again, isn't he? And his disciples, then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You will not see it. Verse 23 of chapter 17. And they will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go after them. Do not follow them. For as the lightning flashes out of the one part of heaven and shines to the other part of heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. In his day, the whole world will see his coming. But first, you must suffer many things. He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. For they ate and they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the, no, the, the day that Noah entered the flood, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, verse 28, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate and they drank and they bought and they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And that day he will, he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take anything away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. What are we to remember about Lot's wife? Jesus said, do not. Right through the angels, the ministers of Jesus, the angels, don't look back. Look, at, does our old life have anything to offer us? Once Jesus has saved you and brought you into a new life, does any old life have anything? No, you can't look back. Once you put your shoulder to the plow, you look straight ahead, right? What happened? She got assaulted on the way out. Why? Because she looked back. Listen, there's no looking back. That old life has nothing to offer me or you. That's what he's trying to say here. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you the truth. In that night, there will be two women in one bed, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding together, and one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two will be watching TV. They'll both be taken. <laughs> this, this is taken in judgment. This is not the rapture. Don't misunderstand this text. This is not the rapture at all. This is taken in judgment. And they answered and said to him, Lord. And so he said, wherever the body is there, the eagles will be gathered together. So the second coming is not coming in a way in which they expect the kingdom that God is bringing about will come through much suffering. But they didn't understand that. They really believed this miracle worker, this one who would raise Lazarus from the dead, will bring about the kingdom of Israel. Now back to John's gospel, chapter 11. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Just giving you a time frame and a context to where we are right now in where we're going to be with the triumphal entry. So in verse 45 of chapter 11 of John's gospel, it says, Then many, many of the Jews who came to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. So there were many who believed in Jesus. And the Pharisees at this point decided that it would be most uh, expeditious for them to kill Jesus for the survival of the nation. But because so many were coming to faith, because J Lazarus was raised from the dead, they were going to kill Lazarus as well. How crazy is that? But Jesus knew that his hour had not yet come. And so look with me. 
in verse 54. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. See, his public ministry to the Jews ending. But went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near him. And he went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So Jesus' Lazarus, raising of Lazarus from the dead happened a few weeks before the Passover. Now on this map, you'll see. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Ephraim is to the north. This is Judea, right? And the land they wouldn't go into is Samaria, and above Samaria is the Galilee region, right? Now, Jesus was at Bethany. That's where he raised Lazarus from the dead, didn't he? But he needed to leave now because of the plot to kill him, kill him, and his hour had not yet come, so he had everything in according to his timetable. And so he went north to the wilderness, and he went into the area of Ephraim. Now he's going to make his way back down to Jerusalem to celebrate, am I in the way? To celebrate the Passover with his death. There, we got an arrow up there, don't we? To celebrate the Passover with his disciples. This will be the last Seder, the last Passover that he celebrates. He said, with fervent desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you. And so he goes from Ephraim to Jericho. And what happened in Jericho? Two blind men were healed. Well, we know blind Bartimaeus was healed. Two of the Gospels say blind Bartimaeus. The Gospel tells us there were two blind men were healed. What else happened? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. You know? No. All right, he saved, he saved Zacchaeus. But before he saved Zacchaeus, he met another rich man. Who was that? The rich young ruler, the rich young ruler. But nonetheless, so he's going to make his way from Ephraim. He's out in the wilderness because he doesn't want the Jews to get a hold of him yet. It's not his time to depart yet. And so he makes his way down to Jericho, and then he goes to Jericho to Bethany. Bethany and What's the other little tiny, tiny village outside of Bethany? Bethphage. Bethphage. We'll see that in Luke 19. Okay. So just to get the geography, you know, he, to go into the wilderness, you had to go north. But they're going to say they're going to up to Jerusalem. Well, if Ephraim is north, how do you go up to Jerusalem? Because it's a higher elevation, right? That's why. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Just give you some orientation uh, relative to where we are. I'll come back to John, but go with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. If I'm not speaking loud enough, you don't hear me, just say so, okay? <clears throat> now, at, th at this point, there was, there was no wonder that Jesus was a miracle worker. Not only did he, he raise Lazarus from the dead, he healed two blind men. Bartimaeus was one. We don't know the name of the other. He gave them sight. That would be one indication that the Messiah came. He would give sight to the blind, that the lepers would be cleansed, the lame would walk, the deaf would hear. And Jesus was doing all of these things. And so there was an innumerable multitude of people that were now following his ministry. And as he goes down to Jericho, he confronts the rich young ruler. Did he come to faith? No, Jesus said it's... it's Easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. But there are some rich men that go to heaven. And who's this one that's mentioned here in 19? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a rich man. And, and he was so repentive and God so touched his heart that he was going to give half of his wealth to the poor. He was going to support the poor house that the Essenes had established. And where did they establish that? Bethany. In Bethany. The house of poverty, or the poor house, where the poor were taken care of. And not only will I give half of my wealth to, to care for the poor, but anybody that I have wronged, I'm going to repay them fourfold. And Jesus said, wow, salvation has come to this house. Why? Money didn't control him anymore. Money didn't mean anything to him anymore. Oh, do I dare go there? <laughs> you know where I'm going to go, don't you? Where am I going to go? What, what does a tithe mean? <laughs> now listen, we're not packing any chicken buckets, so relax. If you're new here, we never, we never take an offering. Why? 
Jesus never takes anything from you. He receives what you offer. There's too many people that take, 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 right? No, he, re he receives what you offer him. So we're not passing any chicken buckets this morning. We don't do that. But God guides, God provides, right? Mm -hmm. But just as Israel had forsook the peace, that personal peace, that quietness of soul and heart, that, that joy that would radiate from within and come out, there's so many today shortchanging what God wants to do in their life. The tithe is what? What is the tithe? Yes. Roughly 10%. What did the Jews give on a regular basis? 30%. If you look at all of the offerings that the Jews had to make, it was 30%. What do you think? I'll give you $1,000 this morning, you give me 100 back. If you come next Sunday, I'll give you another $1,000, you give me 100 back. Can we do that? Would you be okay with that, Angel? <laughs> I don't want more. I just want to, I'll give you 1000 you give me 100 Is that okay? Would you do that every week? Huh? If I offered everybody that, you know how full this church would be? Hmm. Right? But that's, that, that's what the Lord is saying. I've given you 100% of what you have. Is that not true? Do you, do you not believe that God has given you 100% of what you have? Yes. Yeah. And all he asks is, is to test your heart. Does he need your money? No. Doesn't he need anything from you? No. All he desires is your love and devotion. And so he said, just, just give me 10% back. And I'll give you 100%. You give me 10 back. I'll give you 100%. You give me, I'll do that all day long. How about you? <laughs> Why is it only 2% of the church do that? They don't believe. They don't believe. We may look at a parable in a minute where Jesus teaches about the nobleman that's going away to a far country to receive a kingdom. And he gives his servants some mina to do business while he's gone. But the majority were unbelievers, didn't believe anything he had to say. They hated him. But there was one servant who didn't believe he was coming back again either. And he was worried about himself, his personal peace, prosperity, and health. Hmm. So Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. He gave the rich young ruler an opportunity, but just as Jesus declared, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle at the gate. Uh, in chapter 19, he meets Nick and, uh, Zachariah and Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus comes to salvation. And then Jesus gives this parable. Again, there was a mis complete misunderstanding about the kingdom, just as a complete misunderstanding about the kingdom today. Are you familiar with the kingdom now or, or dominion theology? It's heretical. Who were the greatest proponents, by and large, of the kingdom now philosophy or dominion theology? Prosperity gospel, word of faith. Word of faith, it falls right in line. Because it's all about the here and the now. It's not about the spiritual kingdom. What Jesus really has to offer us, which is far more valuable than anything this world has to offer. For what gaineth a man if he should inherit the wealth of the world and lose his soul? What does he gain then, Robert? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's a bad trade-off. Right? So Jesus, again, he's trying to drive home a point, but they're not getting it. And so he gives this parable before he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem because they're all expecting a physical kingdom, the national kingdom of Israel to be established, the yoke of Rome to be, to be broken. But verse 11 of chapter 19, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom in return. Who's the nobleman? Who's the nobleman? Jesus. 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 He's going into a far kingdom. Where's he going? Heaven. He's leaving. He's told them that. Listen, the Son of Man must suffer many things as the, proph as the prophets have foretold. He's going. He's leaving. He told them that. At that Seder, remember in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, he told them such distressing things. One of the things he told them is, I'm leaving. Where are you going? I'm going to receive my kingdom. He's going to do all that the Father has commanded him to do and then rightfully receive that which is his. John sees that where? 
in the Revelation, right? What does he see? A title deed of the earth, the scroll, the kingdom. And no one was found worthy to take the scroll and to loose its seals until he saw what? A lamb who had been slain. So he's going to a far country to receive a kingdom. This is about Jesus. Hmm? And so he called 10 of his servants and he delivered to them 10 minors. And he said to them, do business till I come. And that's what we're to do, occupy. Don't get a white robe and go sit on a mountaintop staring at your navel waiting for the Lord. I'm supposed to prepare and do things as if his coming is a thousand years away. But in my heart, I'm supposed to expect it at any moment. I expected him last night. Woke up disappointed this morning again, you know. Hmm? But the citizens, his citizens, Israel, hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. I'm not a man, I'm a woman. I'm not a woman, I'm a man. Do you understand that's what that's all about? It's madness, it's insanity, it's a spiritual deception, it's demonic. This whole transgender craziness. But what it is, is a rejection of God reigning over us. Let alone, most people don't know the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, summed up into two, right? What's the two? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love me. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. That, that sums up the ten, because the first four deal with our relationship with the Father. The next six deal with our relationship one with another. But forget about knowing the Ten Commandments. They they don't even have the natural law laying upon their hearts any longer. Violating that which goes against nature. Right? But the citizens, his citizens hated him, sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man rule over us. National rejection of Jesus by Israel. Do you understand that there's a natural rejection? A national rejection of the true biblical Jesus in the United States of America? Please, you you need to understand that. I hope you do. Don't be deceived by the alluring music, whether it's Bethel or Hillsong or Elevation. It's the Pied Piper calling all the rats into the sewage to drown. You got to be careful, beloved. We're in a very, very dangerous time, and it's an apostate age. But the true biblical Jesus is rejected here in our nation as he was there in Israel. Verse 15, and so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he is coming again, isn't he? Do you believe he's coming? I remember I first started doing adult Bible studies shortly after I got saved, 1985, in upstate New York. And one of the uh, folks that would attend my Bible study regularly was a a woman who was teaching Sunday school. She taught Sunday school for 50 years in the Dutch Reformed Church. She was my wife's Sunday school teacher, and she liked coming to the Bible study. I was teaching on the second coming. And she was absolutely aghast. I just saw the expression on her face, and I wondered, what is going on? And she stopped everything. She said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me Are you telling me that you actually believe that Jesus is physically coming back to earth? I said, no. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Jesus is physically coming back to the earth. And I believe that. Do you believe that? Oh, here we go again, Pastor. Why so many profess to believe that don't live like that? If Jesus was coming back again, if he's coming back this week, would there be some things that you'd do differently? Would there? I meet an awful lot of people today who call themselves Christian. When I talk about the second coming of Jesus, that Jesus could come in any minute, you know what they tell me? Oh, not yet. What do you mean? John, who was given the revelation of the second coming of Jesus Christ more than any other man, right? What is it to you if this man remains until I I come? And John saw the coming of Jesus Christ, and after he saw all of the revelation, all that was taking place, all of the... What did he say at the very end? Three times? Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Is that what's in your heart? I hope so. Mm. 
For he received the kingdom. And he came to his servants, and he called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Now, what are we trading? What are we gaining? Money? No, no, no. What is he interested in? We talked about prayer. When we were going through John's gospel, working, talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, and when the Holy Spirit prays through you, right? Because Romans 8 tells us we know not how nor what. You don't know how, you don't know what. You need to pray long enough to where you really begin to pray, right? Because most of our prayers are they're pretty rote. It's kind of the same thing every day, you know? But the prayers that God wants us to pray, if we pray in his name, we know he hears us, and whatever he hears us, we know he'll do. So we pray in accordance with his name. To pray in accordance with his name is to pray in accordance with his will. And we looked at several passages that said, when Jesus wants you to pray, what does he want you to pray for? Salvation. The souls of others. Salvation. To gain a profit off of what he's deposited in you. What's he deposited in us? The gospel, the message of salvation, everlasting life. And what are we supposed to do? Go reproduce that in others. Go share that with everyone we can. Now, he's coming back, and we're going to have to give an account with that treasure he's given us. What are you done with it? Are you building your forever house? Your castle? Are you enriching yourself? I mean, it's, it's, beloved, it's time we give ourselves away more and more and more. Because everything that you hold, God, Peter tells us there's a time coming where everything that can be shook will be everything. Everything. You think the Ukrainians alone are the only people that are going to lose everything? Oh, there's a time of trouble coming upon this earth where everyone will lose everything. Wow. So then what's important? My treasure's where? Where thieves can't break in and steal? Rust can't destroy? Moths can't eat? Right? Have you got your investments there? Now, this is, this is precisely what he's talking about here. Hmm. So he came to the first in verse 16. Master, your miner has earned 10 miners. Oh, wow. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little. Have authority over 10 cities. The second came, master, your miners have earned five. Likewise, he said to him, also, you're over five cities. Now, now, your responsibility, the joy and the privilege that we'll have of serving him in heaven is completely related, relative to how we've served him here. Do you understand that? What you've done for him here will determine your position there. I need to get working. I don't want to be just a doorman. Verse 20, and another came saying, Master, here's your mind, huh? I never believed you were coming back to begin with. I, you know, th this guy is a pretender. He's a make-believer. He was a believer or a disciple in name only. Why? Because he did nothing with what the Lord was giving him, that gift. If you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink, right? And I'd give you living water. Jesus talking to the woman at the well. And she took a drink of that living water, and what'd she do? She went into Samaria and told everybody. All of the Samaritans came out to see him. Hmm? I haven't shut up about him since I got saved in 1980, and I can't. I can't. It's my favorite topic, talking about Jesus and his love, his ministry, his mercy, his gospel. Master, here's your minor, verse 20, which I have kept and put it in a handkerchief, hidden it away. <laughs> For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit. You reap what you did not sow. He said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to him who has ten. But they said, Master, Master, he has ten. And he said, for I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. 
but bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. In Matthew's gospel, it says what Christ said of this man who was a pretender in name only, cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And what will his response be? It don't matter how much you danced around the stage. You jumped up and down. There's a lot of people doing that. It's just a bad, it's a substitute for true spirituality. They're feigning spirituality. You think that's spirituality? No. They didn't get it. He was trying to explain to them, I'm going away. I'm depositing in you my Holy Spirit. I'm depositing in you the truth of the gospel. I'm depositing in you not only the ability to understand the gospel, but I'm going to give you the ability to proclaim the gospel through the person of the Holy Spirit. I never in a million years thought I would ever be a preacher, a teacher. The biggest fear I had was speaking before five people. But when God gets a hold of your heart, nothing's impossible. Whatever God has called you to do, he'll equip you to do the same. All you have to do is be willing, be yielded. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom is heaven. The righteousness is what? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus only. Keep your finger here in in Luke 19 and just go to John's gospel again. Chapter 12. So Jesus is making his way from Ephraim from the wilderness. He goes to Jericho. We know what happened in Jericho. He healed the two blind men, one of them Bartimaeus. He confronted the rich young ruler. He saved Zacchaeus. Here in verse 12, it tells us, uh, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1, it tells us, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who was dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Wow. Look at verse 9 for a minute. Then a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest took counsel that they might also put Lazarus to death. Now listen, there's no wonder this crowd gathered around him. Do you know how many people are anticipated to be at the feast during the time of Jesus? The three major feasts were Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. How many times? How long have you been with me? Passover, the most glorious. Spring feast, right? Israel would swell in population to about how many? Two and a half million. You know why we know that? Because Josephus tells us how many lambs were sacrificed during Passover. And a lamb would cover about, oh, 10 people. You got an appetite for lamb? You like lamb? Gail and I went by a, a, a farm the other day, yesterday, as a matter of fact. All these lambs, I said, oh boy, I know where I'm going to get a lamb. Hmm? But when they would slay a lamb for Passover, and it had to be a young lamb, didn't it? How old did this lamb have to be? A year or under. And, and that Passover lamb was sacrificed unto the Lord, but it was consumed by the worshipers. So it took about 10 people to, congest, to ingest the lamb. And they said there's, there's in excess of a quarter of a million lambs slaughtered on Passover. Quarter of a million times 10. Two and a half million people, roughly. Wow. So it's conceivable that the crowds that followed Jesus were probably in excess of a quarter of a million people. Now, that's not hard to believe. You've been to the Billy Graham Library, right? Yes? You see the one picture where where Billy Graham is speaking in Seoul, South Korea, an outdoor gathering, the largest gathering that anyone has ever spoken to with regard to the gospel? How many people were in that outdoor gathering in Seoul, South Korea? One million, 100,000 people, they estimate. Can you imagine that? So, So it's conceivable that this crowd could be a quarter of a million people pressing in on Jesus. Hmm? Back to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. Verse 
Now, when he had said this, said what? What did he say? He said, I'm going away to receive a kingdom. And when I come back, I want to give an account. Right? Hey, I want to, I want to, hey, you guys that were at the study yesterday morning, thank you. The back of the parking lot was full this morning. The front, not so good, but the back, you're doing a great, now you got, right? Right? Park in the back, sit in the front, if you've been here any length of time. Why? Preciousness of others. Why? Make room for some new folks. Hmm? Anyway. When he had said this, said that what the kingdom of heaven was going to be like, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And he came to pass when he had come to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olivet that he sent two of his disciples. What does Bethpage mean? Unripened figs. Now, Bethany has actually two meanings, but the primary meaning that we're going to talk about this morning is the house of poverty. The Essenes, who are the Essenes? They raised John the Baptist down at Qumran, right? The Essenes were the back to the Bible people. The, the Essenes were, were like the, the body of Christ today who are dispensational, believing that Jesus Christ will, in fact, return again. And we take all of those promises with regard to the second coming, literally. Those were the Essenes. John the Baptist was raised by those folk. But they also had a heart for those who were impoverished. And so they started the poor house there in Bethany. And that's why we say house of poverty, but it was also called the house of figs. So he's at the house of unripened figs, the house of figs, and he's at the Mount of Olivet. What is that? The Mount of what? Olives. Olives. Agrarian, huh? Agricultural, right? God wants fruit from our life, doesn't he? What kind of fruit? Spiritual fruit. God, God will give you whatever spiritual gifts you need if you're yielded and submitted to him to produce fruit. And the primary fruit is described as love. Love for God and love one for another. If we're not showing love in the most precious of all relationships, then, then don't bother doing it anywhere else because you're just a hypocrite. Better you not be a hypocrite. He said, go into a village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied. And we know from another gospel, this is a colt of a donkey. On him, no one has ever sat. Loose him and bring him to me. What were donkeys good for? They're beasts of burdens. Burrow, right? What else were they good for? Hey, hey, let me, let me carry you down to Bethany. Get on my donkey. You know, they were good for transportation, right? They're good for, for uh, birds, birds, the beast of burdens, and they're good for transportation. You know what else I discovered donkeys are good for? Huh? They protect Protecting your livestock. It's unbelievable. You're better off having donkeys than, than uh, what is that big dog that everybody gets? Uh, a Great Pyrenees. You're better off having a donkey than a Great Pyrenees. It's amazing. I never knew that. Hmm. So they're protective animals as well. So he's the, now this is exact fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, isn't it? Look at verse 18 for a minute, verse 31. I mean, chapter 18, verse 31. Chapter 18 of Luke's gospel, verse 31. Then he, Jesus, took the 12 aside and said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things, all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. Is that true? How many prophecies were there concerning the first coming of Jesus? 300, over 300 prophecies, very specific prophecies that were fulfilled concerning the first coming of Jesus. So did he have to, to, to really, him and Matthew got together and planned this out like he did his sermon notes? <laughs> Where would anybody get the idea that Matthew helped Jesus plan his sermons? The Chosen. The Chosen, that Mormon film that's out there that most people don't know it's a Mormon film. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy as he lived his life. He, he didn't have to strain at it. He didn't have to plan and plot, but it came about. Why? Because of his foreknowledge. He knew everything was going to take place long before it happened, just as he knew you before the foundations of the world had ever come into existence. He knew each of us. Isn't that amazing? Our God is like none other. 
his birth in a very humble place, the Migdal Edar, right? The Tower of the Flock. Who would have known but a few shepherds? Because the angels had indicated. It wasn't a big celebration on his birthday, was there? No. Most humble of all beginnings. And this is his coronation as king of Israel. What coronation is this? The Victorian age is called the Victorian age. Why? Queen Victoria reigned. Do you know that when Queen Victoria was crowned, coronated, do you know how big the diamond was? Out of the, the many, many jewels that were in the crown, do you know how big the diamond was alone? Over 300 carats. Just one diamond. Fabulous, magnificent, majestic coronation of Queen Victoria. What kind of a coordination is this for the king of heaven and earth? The most majestic, the most wonderful, the most powerful, the most beloved. And... But he knew all things. And he said, go into the village opposite you and you'll find a colt tied. He knew it all. Look at that. He knew the colt was there. He knew it was tied. No one's ever sat on it. He knew that. Loose him and bring him to me. Now, what would you do if I told you to go steal something for me? Now, there was no hesitation from these guys, but, you know, I mean, normally, you know, you don't want to be caught stealing somebody's animals, livestock. There's a severe penalty they would pay. But there was a buzz over that whole area because Jesus was there. The Lord, he was going to bring in his kingdom. And everybody wanted to be a part of that. And he said, if anyone asks you, why are you loosening him? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of him. And so it was, and he said, who were sent, departed, and found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners have said to them, why are you loosening him? And he said, just as the Lord does, the Lord has need of him. Okay, that's simple. Why, why would they not respond? What, what does the Lord have need in your life? Where does the Lord have need of you? Have you responded like these? Hey, okay. It's yours. Or you're like a little toddler in the nursery. Mine. Mine. Now listen, I, again, again, I'm not trying to lay any conviction on you. I'm trying to touch your heart. What is there that, that Jesus would have, have need of in your life? That he could use to increase his kingdom? that he could use to allow his life to ride into somebody else's life. We have to stop being so selfish. As Americans, we are selfish, selfish people. We have no idea the extent to which affluence and greed has captured our lives. You don't. And everything that we spend so much time, so much money, it's all going to evaporate into meaninglessness. Yet, that which is so paramount, so important, we spend so little time. I remember sitting at my office in General Electric. I just got through refurnishing my office, and, and uh, I mean, I, I loved my job. I had a good job. I was well compensated for it. You know, I remember my son came into my office one day. He was going through my Rolodex. You don't know. What the, you, you, did anybody know what those are, you young people? A Rolodex is where you have a list of... He said, Dad... How come, how come under every letter you have a restaurant? <laughs> I said, I got promoted. I'm a professional lunch and dinner eater. I entertain customers. You know, but what a nice job. But boy, you pay for it. <laughs> but I was at my desk, that same desk, and the Lord said, how much time, how much of your life have you spent on yourself and your pursuits and the things you want that are so temporal. That when you exhale here for the last time, they evaporate into meaninglessness. And how much time have you spent, Red, on my kingdom? On those things that would be eternal, that would have value forever and ever and ever. And that day, I, I started my formal resignation. I entered into a job elimination program where I could leave the company. And I've been serving the Lord full-time ever since.
but I, I, I'm not satisfied. I, Lord, I have more to offer you. I have more to give. Keep me busy, Lord, for you and for your kingdom, Lord. What is it the Lord has need of in your life? Is it his will being lived out? Or is it your will? I, I just ask the question, that's all. So they found that just as the Lord has said, the Lord has need of him, verse 35, but they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own garments on the colt and they sat on him. And they put Jesus on him and when he went, he spread their clothes upon the road. They also spent palm branches across the road. Now why a donkey? Huh? No, 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 not this one. <laughs> Never been rode before, but Jesus got on him and away we went. Why the donkey? What does a donkey represent? King. Peace. A king coming in peace. Peace. King David came in, in peace. If he was coming as a victorious conqueror, what would he be riding? What does he ride in chapter 19 of Revelation? A white horse. A white horse. That's going to be the triumphant entry. <laughs> That's when he establishes the national kingdom on earth. Right? But here, here he's coming to bring about a personal peace to everyone who would believe. He's coming soon to control this world. Oh, for a short time, it's going to be under the control of the evil one, right? But that'll end. It's short-lived. It has an expiration date. And so they brought him to him. And when he went, they spread their clothes and palm branches along the road, verse 37. And then as he drew, was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Atah Adonai. No, uh, Baruch Abba Hashem Adonai, right? Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The other gospels said they all sang out Hosanna, Hosanna as the children sang. What does Hosanna mean? Save now. Now, what did they want? They wanted the salvation of the nation. Their personal peace, their prosperity, their health. What did he come to save? Their souls. An entirely different matter. Most, most, most in Christianity today, oh, they want a saved soul, but they want to live a lost. Can you do that? No. Now, are they being deceived? Yeah. It is a deception. There's no accommodation for that in the Bible. There's no accommodation for that in the New Testament. There's no accommodation for that in anything Jesus ever said. When he comes back, he's going to give an account, right? What did you do with what I gave you? Then some of the Pharisees called out to the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and he said to them, I tell you that if these would keep still, these very stones would immediately cry out. Inanimate objects, the whole creation groans, desiring to be restored back into paradise, into its order. Not, just has, not only has the fall affected man, it's a fall, it, the fall has affected the entire creation. And Romans 8 tells us that all creation groans, desiring to be restored. We can't even imagine what this planet is going to be like when Jesus restores it. There's some beautiful places now with nothing in comparison. Mm -hmm. Now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept. Never had to be. Oh, who's that, who's that prophet we've been talking about? There's so many analogies you can make between Jesus and this prophet. Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. For 40 years, Jeremiah cried. For 40 years, he pronounced the judgment that was coming upon Judah, and they wouldn't listen. An entire generation of rebels rejecting what he had to say. And the judgment did come. But even before the judgment, Jeremiah cried. After the judgment, Jeremiah cried. Jeremiah cried till the day he died. Jesus weeps. Why? It was so unnecessary. <laughs> Judah was so far from where they should have been, from where they were when they first began to walk with the Lord, when they first entered into the promised land, and now so far away from him, feigning worship of the Lord. They, they were still going to the temple on Saturdays, but then they had the multitude of idols that they would worship, their pleasures, their positions, right? Right? You know, when somebody goes into ministry, the three things you can't touch. What is it? The gold, the girls, and the glory. Right? 
Look at these people today, these celebrity Christians. The gold, the girls in the glory, that's all they're after. Hmm? Sad, very sad. He wept. Why? Just as Jeremiah wept because it was so unnecessary. All they had to do was, was just obey the word of the Lord. Every single curse that came upon them was a curse that was pronounced hundreds of years before by Moses in Deuteronomy 28. Who brought that upon Judah of old? Who did that to them? They did it to themselves. Listen to me, now listen to me. Who, who brought the judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah? They did that to themselves. Who's bringing the judgment upon this world and this nation? We've done it to ourselves. Oh, New Jersey is so proud. The New Jersey legislature is so proud of the fact that now they can teach their little grade school kids, the little kids that are singing up here, about sex, transgender, homosexual, lesbianism. Is that, is that insane? Is it madness? And don't think for a moment God won't judge that because the most precious gift, the most precious gift he gives us as a people is our children. Our children, we'll give account. Suffer not these little ones to come unto me, Jesus said, right? Better a millstone be hung around your neck and you be cast into the sea than you cause one, just one of these little ones. So Jesus wept, verse 42, saying, if you had known, even you, especially this, your day. Now, I've been through this many times with you. This was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel, the 483 years, the 173,880 days that Daniel prophesied that would take place from the time the command is given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, the Mashiach the Gid, the Prince of Peace, Shashalom. That very day, they should have known. Even if, they, even if they didn't receive Jesus as a, they should have known something monumental, something only God can perform was going to happen that very day. It was prophesied by Daniel to the very day. Daniel is the only prophet who could prophesy the first coming of Jesus to the very day and the second. Daniel prophesies the second, not the rapture, but the second coming where Jesus steps foot on planet earth to the very day. And that's what he's saying here. Why didn't you know this, thy day, and the things that make for your personal peace to settle your heart? Man has been shedding the blood of man since when? Since Cain killed Abel, right? Abel was, what was his occupation? A shepherd. Now, they didn't consume sheep then. Why was he raising sheep? For sacrifice, the worship of God. Cain was just the opposite, a man of the earth. Abel, man of the spirit. Hmm? One temporal, one eternal, one earthly, one heavenly. Hmm. This thy day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, close you on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. It's where we are. How many people are using uh, illicit drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, uh, every other cheap substitute to gain some kind of semblance of peace or contentment in their life when there is none. Look at the number of psychotic problems that exist in our world today. Why? Because we're turning our back on God more and more. And we look at the insanity of what's taking place. When, when, when a man like Elon Musk becomes the savior to try to be the savior of free speech in America, I mean... When Mel Gibson becomes the spokesman for evangelicalism? I mean, do you not realize something's seriously, seriously wrong? But now, like this day, 
there was a personal peace that entered into the hearts of those who would believe, although there were a few. The catastrophic things that happened could not steal their peace, could not steal their joy, could not steal the contentment that they had for godliness with contentment is... And that's the abundant life Jesus came to offer. When Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, Paul described that life. He said, godliness with contentment is a great gain. When, when you're godly and you're content, when you have that peace in you because Jesus resides in your heart, it, it doesn't really matter what happens, and it doesn't matter what you lose. We brought nothing into this world, and it's for sure we're breaking nothing out. Except those who we've invested in, that God has used us to share the gospel, we get to go out with them. Do you realize the time that we're in right now? What time is it? 11.59. We're approaching the midnight hour. And he is coming again. At the Seder that night, there were three groups of people, remember? Remember the three groups at the Seder? The betrayer? Got rid of him right away. Right? And then there was the ten who, they weren't all in. When the rubber hit the road, they sought to seek their own life, to save their own life. But there was one extraordinaire. Who was that? John. John Risked his life at the cross. Right? Much like in our parable of the nobleman, he went away to a far country, left three groups of people behind. What were the three groups? There was the ones who were just outward hostile towards him. Blatant unbelievers, right? Of his own citizens, his own people, they hated him. We'll not have this man rule over us. That characterized today? Yes. Does it characterize today, or am I crazy? No. Then there was the one who was a pretender. He was a follower in name only, a disciple in name only. He never believed the Lord was really coming back. And so he, he lived that way, like the Lord wasn't ever coming back. It's all about me. But then there were the two who invested what they were given to duplicate what God had done in their lives more and more and more. So on this Palm Sunday, if Jesus has really ridden into your heart with that peace that surpasses all understanding, how much are you giving it away? He's going to hold us responsible for our stewardship There's two judgments. There's two resurrections. The first resurrection is for the believers. Now, that first resurrection doesn't happen at the same moment in time. Can I have a few more minutes? That that first resurrection happens over a period of time, okay? But it begins with the rapture of the church. It ends at the end of the tribulation period, that first resurrection. Then there's a second resurrection. That's the resurrection of the of the dead. The first resurrection for believers, the second resurrection for unbelievers. If, if John would say, I celebrated that last Passover with Jesus on Tuesday. And Peter said, I was at that last Passover celebration with Jesus on Wednesday. And Matthew would say, no, I celebrated that last Passover with Jesus on Thursday. Were they all correct? How long is the Passover? Seven days. So the first resurrection is a period of time. It's not a one single moment in time. I want you to understand that and just study the scriptures and realize that. So that first resurrection is for believers. The second resurrection, unbelievers. First resurrection, you stand before the Vima seat of God. B-E-M-A, but it's pronounced Vima. And what happens there? That's where we give an account. That's where he'll ask for our stewardship. What What have you done with what I've given you? The second resurrection What judgment seat do they go before? The great white throne. That's where they will be cast into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for how long? Forever. You know, I don't want to see anybody go there. I don't even want to see Nancy Pelosi go there. (laughs) So, as you leave here this morning, ask yourself, Put a note on your refrigerator, on your calendar, wherever you need to. What am I doing with what the Lord has given me? And you need to ask yourself that every day.
What are you doing? Because he's coming back. I, I believe he's coming back. I believe that coming is soon. And I will give an account for what I've done. And so will you. Now, now, all you have to do is yield. Because it's the Holy Spirit's work in you. That's what I want you to understand. It's almost effortless on your part, except the surrender of your own will. That's what God is looking for. And when you surrender your will, he gives you that empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. What was the next verse? But it is God who works within me both to will and to do. Giving through the Holy Spirit the desire and the ability that I don't have. And I pray that all the time. Help me, Lord. This Palm Sunday, let him ride out in your life. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand, Pastor David?